Hello everyone in CardioMind's channel and after we spoke in the last video about the definition, classification and prognosis of heart failure, we are continuing today with the diagnosis of chronic heart failure. We remember this table from the last video which divides the heart failure into three subtypes. The cardinal feature in the three of them is the presence of symptoms plus minus signs and the difference is in the cutoff point for ejection fraction. An important note that the diagnosis of chronic heart failure is much more likely in those with history of MI, hypertension, coronary artery disease, diabetes, alcohol misuse, chronic kidney disease, cardiotoxic chemotherapy, and family history of cardiomyopathy or sudden death because these factors are considered to be the risk factors to develop LV dysfunction. The typical symptoms that raise our attention once we hear them from the patient during history taking are the dyspnea, hypopnea, paroxysm and nocturnal dyspnea, reduced exercise tolerance, easy fatigability, and ankle swelling, and the less typical symptoms that may occur in heart failure and also in other possibilities, nocturnal cough, wheezes, bloated feeling, loss of appetite, depression, palpitation, dizziness, syncope, and don't forget an important and famous symptom, pendopnea, which means chance of breath when leaning forward. There are some signs that are more specific for diagnosis of heart failure like elevated JPP, hepatojugular reflux, S3, which was tachycardia from the gallop rhythm, and laterally displaced epical impulse. While less specific signs are frequent, like weight gain in the early stages, or weight loss or tissue wasting in the advanced stage, presence of a murmur, peripheral edema, crepitations, pleural effusion, tachycardia, tachypnea, hepatomegaly, ascites, cold extremities, oliguria, narrow pulse pressure. So, of course, their presence may occur in heart failure and other possibilities. That's why we need to have a meticulous history taking and examination. After we finish the history taking and examination, we come to the investigations. We have some of the basic tests that all have class 1 recommendation to be performed in any patient with decompensated heart failure. The most common are the natriuretic peptide like the B natriuretic peptide and N-terminal pro PMP. Why do we need them? First of all, they can rule out the diagnosis in case of normal results, and on the contrary, elevated concentration supports the diagnosis of heart failure, and also they can be useful as a tool for prognostic assessment. For example, if the PMP is less than 35 picogram per milliliter or in terminal pro PMP less than 125 picogram per milliliter or mid-regional proatrial natriuretic peptide less than 40. In this case, the heart failure diagnosis is unlikely. The negative predictive values for these concentrations below the thresholds range from 0.94 to 0.98. We are speaking about high negative predictive value, and there are fewer data or evidence for the mid-regional bro AMP in chronic rather than in acute heart failure. That's why we use an empirical level of less than 40 in order to rule out heart failure. But don't forget that there are many cardiac diseases that can increase the natriuretic peptide beside heart failure like acute coronary syndrome, pulmonary embolism, myocarditis, valvular, congenital heart disease, tachyarrhythmias, contusions to the heart, cardioversion, surgical procedure, all of them involving injury or involving diseased heart muscles so natriuretic peptides are elevated and not only cardiac disease we have also non-cardiac condition like advanced age stroke subarachnoid hemorrhage renal dysfunction liver cirrhosis paraneoplastic syndrome copd sepsis burns anemia thyrotoxicosis diabetic ketosis all of them can cause elevated natriuretic peptides so not only heart failure is a culprit and remember that natriuretic peptide concentration may be disproportionately low in obese patients. So for example, a heart failure patient who have a clear provision diagnosis of decompensated heart failure and is obese, he may have normal natriuretic peptide level, so don't be deceived by this low level. And of course, besides asking for natriuretic peptide, don't forget the basic labs like complete blood picture, kidney function and serum electrolytes, thyroid function test because as we know thyrotoxicosis may be a cause for high output heart failure and hypothyroidism may predispose to decompensated heart failure. 
liver function test because heart failure can result in cardiac cirrhosis and cirrhotic liver can result in cirrhotic cardiomyopathy. And also don't forget the risk factors for ischemic LV dysfunction like lipid profile, hemoglobin A1C, and fasting blood glucose. And if the patient is anemic, we ask for iron profile to check for absolute or functional iron deficiency. ECG is an essential investigation in all heart failure patients. We know that normal ECG makes the diagnosis of heart failure, especially the chronic type, unlikely. And there is a series of abnormalities that can appear, like atrial fibrillation, pathological Q waves in ischemic LV dysfunction, left ventricular hypertrophy, YQRS complex, or left bundle branch block. Moreover, echo is a key investigation for any heart failure patient to assess LV systolic function plus the resting segmental motion abnormalities, assessing LV diastolic function, RV function, valvular function, chamber size, eccentric or concentric left ventricular hypertrophy, and of course assessing the pulmonary artery pressure which may suggest pulmonary hypertension. Don't forget please the chest x-ray because it is recommended to investigate other potential causes of dyspnea, for example, presence of a mnemonic shadow, which may be comorbid with a heart failure or may be the sole explanation for the patient's symptoms and also it can provide supportive evidence of heart failure, for example, signs of pulmonary congestion as curly beeline and cephalization or cardiomegaly. So these are the basic investigations for any patient with a provisional diagnosis of chronic heart failure. What about the specific investigations that can be helpful to determine the cause of LV dysfunction or heart failure? We saw this table in the last video which shows us the different causes of heart failure, their presentation and some of the specific investigations that help to prove them. For example, cardiac MRI is one of the famous investigations that is recommended as a class 1 to assess myocardial structure and function in those who are poorly echogenic and also it has a class 1 recommendation if you are suspecting infiltrative disease, Fabry disease, myocarditis, non-compaction, amyloidosis, sarcoidosis and iron overloads. And the addition of late gadolinium enhancement can be considered in dilated cardiomyopathy to distinguish between ischemic LV dysfunction, which shows subendocardial scar, and non-ischemic myocardial damage, which usually show mid-wall scar. The famous dilemma of asking for invasive coronary angiography in any patient with heart failure or LV dysfunction is of course not accurate. There is a class 1 indication to have invasive coronary angiography in patients with anginal pain despite pharmacotherapy or he's having symptomatic ventricular arrhythmia because you are suspecting that this patient would be a candidate for coronary revascularization and it has class 2b in patients with intermediate to high pretest probability and he's having heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and there is ischemia in non-invasive stress testing. So there is nothing called the routine coronary angiography for any patient with heart failure. What about the CT coronary angiography? It can be considered in patients with low to intermediate pretest probability or they are having equivocal results in the non-invasive stress testing in order to rule out coronary stenosis. So here we are having a non-invasive test rather than the invasive coronary angiography. And there is class 2B for non-invasive stress imaging like cardiac MRI, stress echo, technician scan, positron emission tomography for assessment of myocardial ischemia and viability in those with coronary artery disease. Although we are using, of course, viability testing as a routine in our clinical practice, but its evidence is still class 2B, warranting further evidence. And the exercise testing also may be considered to detect reversible myocardial ischemia and investigate the cause of dyspnea. But the cardiopulmonary exercise testing rise to class 1 as a part of evaluating a patient for heart transplantation or mechanical circulatory support like LVSS device, and it has class 2A to optimize prescription of exercise training, and also it has class 2A to identify the cause of unexplained dyspnea or exercise intolerance. Right heart catheterization is an essential investigation in patients with severe heart failure being evaluated for heart transplantation or mechanical circulatory support, it has a class 2A in patients with heart failure who is suspected to have constrictive pericarditis, restrictive cardiomyopathy, congenital heart disease, or high output heart failure because echocardiography would not be enough in these cases. For example, 
constrictive pericarditis cannot be solely diagnosed by echocardiography. Also, it should be considered in patients with suspected pulmonary hypertension in order to confirm the diagnosis and assess its reversibility before the correction of valvular or the structural heart disease, for example, presence of left right shunt. And it has class 2B in patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction to confirm the diagnosis together with the echo plus minus cardiac MRI. Endomyocardial biopsy was one of the classic investigations in the last decades, but now it has limited role after the advance in cardiac MRI. Still having a class 2A in patients with progressive heart failure, when you have a specific diagnosis that can be confirmed only by myocardial sampling and histopathological examination. Otherwise, you don't need to use endomyocardial biopsy in presence of cardiac MRI, which can help you with tissue characterization. So after we explain the diagnostic steps for heart failure, we can reach this diagnostic algorithm. If we have a patient with suspected heart failure due to presence of risk factors, symptoms and or signs or abnormal ECG, at the time we refer to the natriuretic peptide. If they are less than 125 for the nt pro -PMP or less than 35 for the BMB, in this case the heart failure is unlikely and we need to search for other diagnoses. But if they are more than 125 or more than 35 respectively, or you have a strong suspicion of heart failure without the need for natriuretic peptides, or they are not available in your hospital, at the time you resort to the echocardiography, which if it is showing abnormal finding, in this case you confirm the diagnosis of heart failure, and it can be divided into three subtypes, either reduced, mildly reduced, or preserved ejection fraction, and then you can seek specific investigations to determine the etiology and start specific treatments. So our take home message in our video today is that still symptoms plus minus signs are the cornerstone to diagnose heart failure being a clinical syndrome. But you need to ask for some basic essential investigations like lab testing, ECG, echo and chest x-ray. And then you ask for more complex investigation according to the suspected etiology to start a specific treatment. Thank you very much for watching this video and wait next week as we are going to start the pharmacotherapy.